Thanks for checking out the weekly sermon from Church of the Resurrection. We pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. We'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services, whether in live worship online at court.org slash live or in person at one of our locations in the Kansas City area. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about our service times and ministries, please visit Cora.org. We hope you enjoy this message. As we continue in worship, I invite you to hear these words of scripture. Our first passage today is from Isaiah chapter six. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings, with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And from Revelation chapter 12, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scripture. Let all mortal flesh keep silence And with fear and trembling stare Ponder nothing earthly minded For with blessing in his head Christ our God to earth Descended Our full homage to demand Today we're going to talk about the heavenly hosts This is the angels of heaven, the heavenly forces We're going to try to understand what the Bible teaches about them Then we're going to talk about fallen angels We'll talk about the devil and his minions And then we're going to talk about what all of this means to us As we seek to be the earthly host that corresponds to the heavenly host, the angels So let's begin with the heavenly host And if you've not heard of this term, you're not familiar with it It shows up hundreds of times in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament Where God is the Lord of hosts and, And we read about the heavenly hosts But we're most familiar with it as Christians in the New Testament in Luke chapter two, and we sing about it every year at Christmas time. So let me just remind you of these words we sing as we pass the candlelight. We sing silent night on Christmas Eve. And these are the words to one of the verses, silent night, holy night, shepherds quake at the sight. Glory stream from heaven afar, heavenly hosts. There they are, sing alleluia. Christ the savior is born. Christ the savior is born. The line comes from what happens in Luke chapter two, when an angel appears to the shepherds on that night when Jesus was born. And you remember the words, fear not, the angel says, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David or in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And you remember what happens next? This is what we read. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. There it is again, the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards all people. So what is this heavenly host? And does it matter to us in any way? That's what we're gonna explore today. So the heavenly host, the Greek word in Luke, the New Testament's written in Greek, is stratia. 
for host or heavenly host. Stratia means army. So this is a heavenly army. That's the word. And when we go to the Old Testament, where most often we find the descriptions of the host or the heavenly host or God's host, we read uh, the Hebrew word is Sabaoth. Sabaoth. Sabaoth is a word you might have heard before if you ever sang Martin Luther's famous Reformation hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, where he talks about Jesus and he says, Lord, Sabaoth his name from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. It's Jesus, the Lord of heavenly forces, the Lord of the heavenly armies. And so uh, Sabaoth, like stratia, means army. Our English word host comes from the Latin hostis. Hostis also means, you want to guess? Army. It means army. And you recognize the word hostis in hostilities or hostile. Uh, same idea. There's fighting. There's conflict going on. But it actually meant in Latin an army. Okay, 295 times in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, well, 293 times, God is referred to as the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. And there's two more times that shows up in the New Testament. So the Lord of the heavenly armies. God is the, is the head. He, he, he is the leader of the heavenly armies. He's got this massive force at his disposal in the heavens. All right, we'll try to understand what that means in a minute, but I want to remind you that even Jesus uses this idea. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 26, he's being arrested. And you may remember as he's being arrested, Simon Peter takes out his sword and lops off the ear of the high priest's servant or slave. And Jesus says, put your sword away, stop. And you remember in Luke's gospel, he heals the man's ear. And, uh, and then Jesus says this, do you think that I'm not able to ask my father and he will send to me more than 12 battle groups or 12 legions of angels right away? Now, a legion was, or a battle group was 5,000 soldiers. He says, it, it, like this, if I asked my father, he would send 60,000 angels to fight for me. But that's not the path I'm on. My battle is not going to be won that way. I'm going to win the battle by laying down my life, by suffering and dying for humankind by showing them the depth of God's love and calling them to a different pattern of life, to agape, to love, and then by being raised from the dead. So Jesus demonstrates that sacrificial love on the cross, but he had the capacity, he could have called forth 60,000 angels. I love the fact that he's drawing upon that same idea in the Hebrew Bible. When you look in the Old Testament, you find again and again, these angels are powerful. They have power. And so, so you find in uh, it's 2 Kings chapter 19, there's one, just one example I'll share with you. Uh, so King Sennacherib, he is from Assyria. He's leading the Assyrian army against Jerusalem. Little of Jerusalem doesn't stand a chance against the most powerful empire in the world at that time. And so Sennacherib's armies are surrounding the city of Jerusalem and they're going to destroy it. They built their ramparts and they're going to destroy it. They've already destroyed other cities, taking the people away into slavery back in Assyria or, or into exile back in Assyria. And, and then we read that, uh, that the king Hezekiah cries out to God and God delivers him. And this is what happens. Uh, 2 Kings 19.35, that very night, the angel of the Lord set out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians, 185,000. And that was just one angel. And God has access to an innumerable number of angels. And so this whole thing about the, the Lord of hosts and the heavenly hosts, it's about God's power. Some read these literally and imagine these, you know, these hosts, the heavenly hosts, and you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of the heavenly hosts. Others say it's a metaphor, it's a, it's a symbol of God's power. When you get to the New International Translation of the, New, of the Old and New Testament, in the Old Testament, they don't actually say Lord of hosts as a title for God. Instead, they say Lord Almighty as a way of saying they recognized many people didn't know the word host anymore. And so they said, this is really about God's power. God is all powerful. There is no comparable to God. There is nothing that could defeat God. God ultimately will defeat all of his enemies. That's what this is teaching in the scripture. So when you read about the heavenly host, even those that come to, to uh, announce good news of great joy and, and, and peace on earth and goodwill to all people, that's the intention of this army of God is to bring peace on earth, goodwill, to all people, but there is this massive army. God is all powerful and undefeatable. That's what we're meant to see. So we may live in a time where we feel hopeless. We may live in times where we, you know, we despair at what we see happening in the world around us, but ultimately the victory belongs to God. That's part of what we recognize when we talk about the heavenly hosts, the armies of angels. All right, I was thinking about World War II. And as I was studying World War II again this last week, I was looking at the tipping points. So there are battles that happen. And in each one of these battles is another, you know, gets closer to the tipping point where even though the war is going to continue, there is no doubt who's going to win in the end. And one of those key tipping points was on D-Day. So on D-Day, June 6, 1944, and you can see some scenes from D-Day here on the screen. 
156,000 Allied troops stormed the beaches of Normandy. Paratroopers parachuted behind enemy lines. It would take 11 months, 11 months until the war was over. But there was no question after they'd succeeded on the beaches of Normandy that Germany was going to surrender. Germany might not have been clear about that, but most everybody else who was watching the war progress from here knew that it was only a matter of time before Germany was defeated. Now, the battle would continue to go on for 11 months, but finally on May 8, 1945, it was Victory in Europe Day. And you see that on the video screen here. And what happened on that day when, when the Nazis surrendered, unconditionally surrendered, and then everybody began to celebrate around the world because the war was over, at least war with Germany was over at that point, not quite finished in other parts of the world, but soon to be finished. And that paints a picture for us of how we look at the world today. If by faith, we actually believe that God is all powerful and undefeatable, he is the Lord of hosts, then we can look at what's happening in our world. And by faith, we can say, we may walk through this battle now. We may be walking through this darkness now, but the darkness, as we often say around here, the darkness doesn't have the final word evil and hate and sin and death, they do not have the final word because the Lord is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heavenly forces. He is almighty. He is all powerful. And so the rebellion that happens or the darkness that happens is not going to last forever. Victory has already been won. When you read the book of Revelation, it's the last book in the Bible. We get to the the very last book of of the 66 books of the Bible, and we're going to find that it over and over again paints a picture for us of this idea of this epic battle that's happening in the heavens, and then it makes its way here on earth, and 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 you know this is where we come to the battle of Armageddon and all of this you know all of this final victory in the end, and what you see again and again and again. And by the way, angels are mentioned more often in the book of Revelation than any other book. Isaiah, I think, has a similar number. No, it's mentioning the host. Uh, 55 references to angels in Revelation. And in Revelation, we find over and over and over again that the angels of the Lord and God himself defeats the powers of darkness. So we read this. This is just one battle that we read about in Revelation chapter 12. And war broke out in heaven. Michael, he's the archangel, Michael, one of only two na- angels that are named. Gabriel is the other. We'll talk about him next week. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back and they were defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Again, whether you read that literally or metaphorically, you recognize what it's saying is that in the end, evil cannot have the final word. It has already been defeated. It just doesn't recognize it yet. And I love how in scripture, you know, the scripture writers, Paul in particular, talks about how the forces of evil are defeated on the cross. That was like the decisive battle was on the cross and in Jesus' resurrection, where he he clearly defeated. It was the tipping point in history. But actually, even before that, there was no question that the power of God was so much greater than the powers of darkness. All right. I want to talk about fallen angels for just a couple of minutes, the devil and his demons. So uh, when we talk about the devil, there's several names that are applied to the devil. In the Old Testament, we find he shows up first in, uh, in Genesis chapters two and three. And here we find that the, uh, Genesis chapter three, actually, here we find that Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. Now, again, we read this story archetypally. We can read it literally, but I see it more archetypally, that this story is telling us about humankind, not just about two people who lived a long time ago. God has placed them in paradise and said, there's one tree you're not supposed to eat the fruit of, and it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But you remember there's a serpent there, a talking snake, and begins to talk to them and begins to whisper to them, you know what? The fruit is really good here, and God's holding out on you. You really should try this. I know God said not to have it, and you're going to lose paradise, but it won't really be like that. You're not going to die. It's going to be fine. And begins to rationalize with Eve and then with Adam to eat the forbidden fruit. Now, part of what we recognize there is the church doesn't doesn't call the serpent uh, in Genesis, doesn't say the serpent or the snake is the devil. We look back on that and say, that's really what the devil does. And in Revelation, we see that, that he is that serpent who is seeking to deceive us, to lie to us and to lead us astray. So he becomes known in the New Testament as the tempter and he tests us. Now, in the Old Testament, the devil is a part of God's, you know, sort of circle. I mean, he's, he's, he's just another angel or another celestial being, and he plays a particular role. So we have the tempter, and he's tempting, and he's testing. We come to the book of Job, and we find he's called the Satan. So the Satan is, uh, it's not a title. I mean, it's not a, it's not a name, a, per, a personal name. It is a title and describes a role that somebody plays. And the Satan uh, means literally the accuser or the adversary. 
So the accuser or the adversary. And, uh, and it's always comes, almost always comes in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament with the word the beforehand. So it's the Satan, the accuser, the adversary. And he begins to play this role, or at least we find him playing this role, in particular in the book of Job. So the book of Job begins, and you remember it's the epic suffering of a man and, uh, and the devil or the, the Satan comes to God and says, you know what? I know you think Job is a really great guy, but let me tell you, if he experienced any suffering or hardship, he wouldn't follow you. He'd quickly fall away. And so God says, okay, well, show me. And, you know, he sets some parameters around what the devil can do or what Ha-Satan, the Satan can do, Ha-Shatan. He says, uh, he says, okay, you can't do this, but well, let's just see. And he becomes the tester of the resilience and the faith of Job. Now, Job is an epic poem. It's pretty unfair if you think of it, you know, literally, although it really paints a picture again. It's written in Hebrew poetry, but paints a picture again of uh, unjust suffering and how we make sense of that and what we do with that. But, but here, as it begins, it is the tester who's testing. And you always get the sense in the Old Testament that the devil is always under God's thumb. Like he's, he's not strong. He's, he's in no way comparable to God's power. Uh, we come to another passage. This is in, uh, in Zechariah chapter three, verses one and two. And you get the sense that the, the Satan, the accuser, the adversary, uh, becomes an irritant to God. And so he comes and there is this scene where God has chosen the high priest Joshua and, the, and Joshua is standing there. And then whether, whether he can see or not see these other figures that are with him, there is the angel of the Lord and then there is the Satan. And in this, in this scene, uh, we hear these words. Then he showed me, this is God showed Zechariah the prophet, the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. I mean, you just get the sense of God chastising this creature. All right, when we get to, to the period between the Old and New Testament, there's a lot more interest in Judaism in the idea of the devil and, and the role that he plays. And by the time you get to the New Testament, there's a sort of clarifying about, you know, who this figure is or what's happened in, his, you know, in him and through him. And so in the New Testament, we find the word devil used of him. The word devil is from the Greek diabolos, which means slanderer. So now the devil is not just a tempter, but he's also a slanderer. He's not just an accuser, but this is kind of an extension of that. He is a slanderer and he slanders people. He slanders them to themselves. He, he whispers in their own ears, you're not worthwhile. You, you, you aren't really loved. You aren't really a child of God. There's all kinds of lies that we tell ourselves or the voices that we hear in our head that end up bringing us down. Well, you know, the New Testament sees that as partly the role that he plays and now it's seen as though the devil is in rebellion against God. So no longer serving as a part of God's sort of you know, entourage and playing a particular role, but now he's actually rebelled against God. And so uh, he and, and a number of other angels have turned away from God and are, and are trying to do their own thing. They've rebelled against God like Adam and Eve had done in the beginning. And, uh, and in Revelation, we find that there's a third of the angels who are cast down you know, to the earth. I think that's in Revelation. When Christians have looked back to the Old Testament, they have found a picture of that or a sort of a, a sign of that or an image of that in two passages, one in Isaiah chapter 14, where the king of Babylon has been thrown down from his throne He'll be defeated because of his hubris. And, and in, uh, I think it's Ezekiel chapter 28, the king of Tyre is also brought down from his throne because of his hubris. And so Christians have looked back on those two texts and said, well, that's a picture of what happened with the devil. Now, the Old Testament doesn't try to say that's the devil, but it's certainly how Christians have read those texts is to see in his hubris, he's turned away from serving God and sought to lead a group of angels in opposition to God. So now we have this epic battle between the angels of light and the angels of darkness. And and that really is also, it may be very literal in the heavens and the heavenly realm, but it also paints a picture for us of how life works. Even in our own lives, we find that epic battle between good and evil, between light and darkness in our lives. And this is a picture of that. Now, I want you to notice clearly a couple of things. I want you to notice when Jesus is tempted by the devil, and I don't think there was a devil in a pitchfork and red spandex tights. I think he was hearing the whispering of the devil in his ears or in his mind, just like we do when we are tempted to do something we shouldn't do. And the devil is, is tempting him in a couple of ways. You remember Jesus has just been baptized and, uh, and in his baptism, he hears the father say, you are my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And, and then the devil comes and whispers while he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, if you are really the son of God. So the devil whispers self-doubt. And I know he's done that in your life. I'm guessing, I, I know he's done it in my life where there are times where I begin to doubt myself or maybe I doubt whether God really loves me or I doubt if there really is a God or I doubt, it. there's a thousand things I might doubt. 
And I think he often whispers that. Now, doubt is okay. I, I just wrote a book about doubt. There's nothing wrong with doubt. But I think the devil loves to plant self-doubt and loves to help us think, you know what? You aren't really loved by God. And maybe there really isn't any hope. And you should just call it quits. The devil whispers things like that in our ears. And we've got to recognize that voice and realize that doesn't come from God. That's, that's the slanderer slandering me. And I want you to hear that during this season when a lot of folks struggle with depression or, or you know, feeling down during this season, or, or, or we begin to question ourselves or self-doubt. I want you to hear that those voices that tell us to do things that are destructive to ourselves or that will destroy, you know, hurt other people to, to you know, lead us down a path that, that is going to bring harm to ourselves or other people, those voices are not from God. They are from the dark side, from the evil one. But I also want you to remember that the darkness is easily defeated by Christ. So when we think about the demons, you know, they, they, uh, they inflict, afflict people in the gospels. And, and then you find whenever they come in contact with Jesus, they are terrified. They are terrified of Jesus' power. When Jesus says, jump, they say, how high? They shake when Jesus comes. They beg him for mercy, which gives us a sense again of the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty and the darkness and the de devil and the, and the rebellious angels. They have no power over God. They have no power over Jesus. And so I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 16, verse two. He says, the God of peace will shortly crush Satan under your feet. We don't have to listen to his voice. And when we hear it, we can say, in the name of Jesus, leave me alone. I don't believe that. That's not who Jesus says I am or what Jesus said I should do. I am not gonna listen to you. I love how the, how not the gospels, two of the epistles say that we can resist the devil and he has to leave us. He's like a roaring lion, but when you resist him, he has to flee. That's what scripture teaches us about the dark side. You can resist him. Don't listen to him. Don't give in to him. And God, in the end, has got you. When you're on his side, when you're on God's team, and you got to decide, do I want to be on the losing side and the side that brings destruction and darkness, or do I want to be on the side that brings light and life, hope and joy that ultimately has the victory? All right. So that leads me to ask this question. You know, as we talk about angels and demons and we talk about, you know, you might read these things very literally or you might read them a little more metaphorically. However you're reading them, there is a battle going on in the world around us between good and evil. We feel it in our lives. We see it on the evening news. We recognize it in our relationships. That battle is real. And we either call upon the power of Christ and we walk in his light or we walk away from it. And so I want to encourage you not only to walk in his light, but I want to encourage you to be part of his earthly force, his earthly host. So there's the heavenly host, but here's what we know. We talked about this before, that most often when God is at work in the world, it's not that he's sending legions of angels. Jesus said, I could call for them, but no, we're going to do it a different way here. And so often in life, it's the earthly messengers that God uses to accomplish his purposes. And when I think about this, Jesus said he could have called down five, what, 12 legions of angels, 60,000 angels. But as I think about that here on earth, there are 2 million Christians here on earth. Think about that. Jesus doesn't need to call, he doesn't need to call down five legions of celestial angels to do his work. He has 2 billion Christians with hands and feet and voices. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're among them. A third of the world's population he has at his disposal. If we're only willing to listen, if we're only willing to say, here I am, Lord, send me, use me. If we're only paying attention, we become his voice, his hands, his feet, in a world where there is a battle going on between good and evil. All right, I wanna give you a couple of examples of what this looks like, you know, what heavenly or earthly angels look like when they're actually living as a part of, of God's host here on earth. But first I wanna remind you how God fights, how Jesus calls us to fight, how the apostle Paul calls us to fight. For Jesus, you know, he's fighting by laying down his life. He calls us to turn the other cheek. He calls us to love our enemies and to be light and salt in our world. And Paul says it this way, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now this coming year is 2024. It's a presidential election year. I know many people who say, you know, when it comes major elections, I'm ready to move to Canada. I mean, we know what happens. Our, our country becomes so polarized. And I have to believe that the devil laughs. I have to believe that he looks forward to election years every time they come around because what he knows, the slanderer, the accuser, the divider, the, the, the one who loves to bring conflict, that he takes joy because he knows that's exactly what he can do during an election season. 
is he can pit Democrats against Republicans, liberals against conservatives. He can, you know, he can pit us against each other, our family members. So our families, we don't even talk sometimes after the election season because we find ourselves injured by the way we have spoken about each other and our differences uh, in, in what we do. It's TV spots. It's radio spots. It's an incessant number of, of, of uh, you know, postcards that come to our homes. And, and are any of those accurately reflecting the character, you know, the people on the other side, their opponents? Usually not, right? These are human beings. Many times they're Christians. They're people of the same faith. Sometimes people in the same church. And yet we've created this conflict, this massive conflict where we become the accusers. We become the slanderers. We become the tempters and the testers. We become the adversaries. And when we do that, we have, we've actually become, become followers of the dark side, the prince of demons, we, we haven't pledged ourselves to the devil. We just do the things that he did or that he wants us to do in this world. So I want to remind you, starting in 2020, we said, how about if we work together as God's people to counteract that? What if we reminded people what it means to be human? And what if we reminded them of some basic things the Bible teaches, some basic Christian ethics every major election season? And so we started in 2020. We had campaign signs and t-shirts and sermons and, and all kinds of stuff that we did built around the idea of love your neighbor. And then we went from that in 2022 with, uh, with Micah 6.8, uh, Be Just, Be Kind, Be Humble, the B campaign. This time around for 2024, our campaign is going to be built around what Jesus said was the summation of the law and the prophets, and that was the golden rule. Do you remember it? Let me put it on the screen and we can say it together. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so our campaign for 2024 is do unto others. And we're going to have campaign signs and t-shirts and public service announcements and, you know, billboards and radio spots and, and a whole series of sermons and small groups getting together around this. And we're going to be, we're going to be doing service projects in the community to bring people together. And, and I'm so excited about this. And there are hundreds of other churches across America who are joining with us in this. And it's going to launch in the fall of 2024. But this last week, I had a meeting where I got to see some of the preliminary billboard, not billboards, some of the preliminary yard signs. And I thought you might enjoy seeing these too. So let's put them up on the screen. And I'm going to invite you to do something if you would. If you would take out your phone, and I'd like for you to text the number 913-914-2600 and tell us which of these signs you would put in your front yard. So number one, number two, number three, or number four. And you're going to help us decide which of the two signs are the ones that we're going to print and make available in the fall. So the let's do unto others kindness is a vertical sign. The other ones are, they're all the same size, but the other ones are look a little smaller on the screen. But I'd love for you to go ahead and text that number. And why don't you tell us which of these should we print that you would want to put in your yard? And I'm so excited about this because all of this together in the fall is going to be about trying to bring people together together. Well, I think the devil using politics is trying to pull us apart. So we become messengers of the Lord in helping us love our neighbors and love our enemies and do unto others as we would have them do unto us. How cool is that? So that's going to be coming up, t-shirts, lots of other stuff. You'll hear more about that in late summer when you can order your t-shirts and, and all these other things. I just wanted to invite you to help us make a decision about which of those signs we would be printing off. All right. So... That leads me to a couple of meetings I had this week. I was, uh, on Thursday of this week, I had, a, uh, I had a whole series of meetings. The first meeting of the day was with an angel. And that angel's name is John Yost. John is a member of our Resurrection West location. He's a pharmacist by training. And several years ago, a couple of years ago, he had a vision. What if, what if we could start a pharmacy for people who can't afford medication? And you've heard about this before, the pharmacy of grace. And what if we could make sure that people don't have insurance, they could get medication? What if people have insurance, but they can't afford a copay on a very expensive drug? Is there a way for us to work with pharmaceutical companies to be able to get drugs that are donated that we can make sure people have access to so that they can be healthy and well? People who are walking in a very dark place, physically, emotionally, spiritually, how can we bring light to them? And he became an angel. And he and a group of other people started the Pharmacy of Grace. Here's the, a photo of the employees at Pharmacy of Grace. And you know, every one of them could be working somewhere else and making more money. But they said, we want to be a part of changing the world. These are angels you see right here, a company of the earthly host corresponding to the heavenly host. My day ended that day. So I, I was so moved by that. And my day ended that day by talking to Dr. Tom Keller. And so Tom, uh, Dr. Kettler, started uh, with several other people, a medical group in the southern part of Kansas City called College Park Medical, gosh, a little bit before we started Church of the Resurrection. And, uh, and I just had a chance to sit and listen to what he's been up to. And uh, 14 years ago, 
he had this vision of wanting to start a medical clinic for people who couldn't afford to go to the doctor. At 30th and Prospect, which is an area that has been some of the you know, most impoverished people in Kansas City, some of the folks who were living in, in you know, a pretty dark place, many of them. And he said, let's start a medical clinic for these folks. So while he's still running his clinic and you know, a full-time doctor there, he and a group of other folks go down and they start this other clinic. And, uh, and today they're seeing about 5,000, they have about 5,000 patient visits each year. 5,000 patient vis- visits each year. And, and the impact on people who were there who couldn't have gone to see the doctor, wouldn't have gone to the emergency room, and suddenly people who are walking in a dark place finding themselves living with hope. Here's a photo of his team uh, down at, and this is just a part of his team. He's got several others who are part of it as well. But I look at the smiles on their faces and I'm like, this is another company of angels. These are part of God's earthly host who are seeking to serve God, to be his hands and his voice, to care for people who are in need. I love this. And light is coming in there. And you see people who might've been thinking, you know, the, the, you know, life is hopeless and there's no reason to keep going. Suddenly you're finding there is a reason to keep going. And there are people who love me and care for me and God is with me. And, and they become instruments of God's saving grace and mercy for people who are struggling. Now, not all of us can go start medical clinics or pharmaceutical, you know, pharmacies for people who can't afford. But I'm reminded of St. Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who said this, we cannot all do great things but small things done with great love can change the world. Now, some say she might not have said that. Maybe somebody else said it. Whoever said it, it's exactly right. Small things done with great love can change the world. And that leads me to tell you one final story of an angel that I saw. So um, this young woman's name is Sammy. And Sammy is, lives here in the Kansas City area. She lives in, in uh, Lewisburg. Sammy watched, she's in high school. She watched what happened in Uvalde, Texas in 2022, May of 2022. And she, she saw the news of a shooter, a kid who'd gone to this elementary school, Rob Elementary School, goes into the school, now, you know, 18 years old, he goes into the school that he'd gone to as a child, and he starts shooting. And again, it looks like darkness has just had the final word. There are 19 children and two, che- two teachers who are killed and 17 other children who were severely injured, who were injured, some of them very severe, uh, some recovered fairly quickly. But but she's watching this news like we were all watching the news and it just, you, your heart breaks and, and we all wring our hands, but you know, many of us didn't do anything about it. And she thought, I'm gonna do something about it. And, and she thought, what can I do? And she thought, well, I, I wanna try to, I wanna try to, you know, I wanna try to get toys to take down to these kids. It wasn't starting a clinic. It wasn't solving violence and school shootings in the world. It's just, there are children down there and I want them to know that they are loved by people in Kansas City. And so she starts collecting these presents and, uh, and a month or so ago, she went down to Evaldi and she brought, I don't know how many boxes, 35 or 40 boxes of toys she took down there for these children, just set them up in the library. The library said, come on, bring them. And these kids from Rob Elementary School walk through and they get to pick out toys. And it was just a sign. This shall be a sign to you. <laughs> show, there'll be a teenage girl coming from Kansas City, bringing toys to say you were loved and God hasn't forgotten you and that there's hope. I mean, these are the small things done with great love that will change the world. So, uh, so I wanted you to have a chance to see the TV story that was run on Sammy not long ago. Take a look. Shope explains how she's making a difference from thousands of miles away. We had 13 boxes ranging between 15 and 60 pounds. That's a lot of donated toys, all collected by now 17-year-old Sammy McGee. These are just little kids that had gone through something absolutely unimaginable. And she says... They needed love, they needed help. So Sammy spent months collecting toys to take to Uvalde, Texas, and on Saturday her family was finally able to get them to kids there. These little kids, probably like five years old, coming up to me saying thank you as they're holding a stuffed animal that was donated. Sammy got with a local library and set up a room for families in the town to just walk in and pick out a toy. I wanted them to know that they had that love and support from someone even in Kansas City. While in Texas, Sammy was able to see the memorials there and meet families affected by the school shooting. It really puts into perspective the innocence of the school, but the tragedy that happened that day. As Sammy was setting up her toy drive in Uvalde, a group in town gave her an award. I just want people to know that after being around these families, that even though it's been a year and after the world has moved on, after we've moved on, that these families, they still need love. They still need help. Trauma has not gone away. In Lewisburg, Alan Chilp, KMBC 9 News. I'm really proud to say that Sammy is a part of our youth group here at Church of the Resurrection. And she sent me a few additional pictures. I want you to have a chance to see these pictures. I mean, take a look at this one. 
And I just love that. Look at the, you know, you just see, you have a chance to experience and see the impact one person can make in this picture and, and this one too. And, and so it, it wasn't some massive, huge thing that solved school shootings. It was just one teenage girl who said, hey, would anybody want to help me to bring a little bit of love and light to some kids walking in darkness? And that leads me to wonder what you can do. And today there's one opportunity you have. So, uh, I mean, you have lots of opportunities every single day of the week, but, but every Sunday or every weekend during the season of Advent, you have an opportunity to contribute and help other people who are in need. So this weekend at Resurrection, we are, we are collecting toys. These toys are going to our partner schools. We have nine elementary schools in some of the lowest income communities in Kansas City. A lot of single parent homes, a lot of violence in some of these places. And what we do to keep these kids in school and to encourage them, we have little stores at these schools. And we do a ton of other things, but we have little stores in these schools. And the kids get, you know, dollars to be able to purchase things in those stores and uh, they can save them up or they can spend it all at one time, you know, very quickly. But, you know, every time they're nice to another kid, every time they, you know, they, they, they have perfect attendance for a week or a month. I don't remember the numbers, but, you know, when they do well in reading, when they meet certain goals, they get these dollars and the schools say, this is having a huge impact on our kids. They're so excited to be able to do this. And so we're going to ask you to replenish the toy stocks for these schools. And it's really easy to do that. If you go to core.org slash next, uh, you can actually, uh, you'll find there's a link that you can click on and it'll take you right to an Amazon page. You can pick one or more toys and all those toys will be, if you select under where to deliver them to, you can select to deliver where the registry was you know, from, from and they will deliver the toys here and we will make sure they get in the schools. And those of you at all of our other locations and in the foundry, you know, we have these bags in the Narthex where you can do the same thing. You can pick them up and you have a chance to just get one toy or three or four or five toys, whatever you'd like. But you have a chance to do what Sammy did in bringing light to people this week. So I want to encourage you to do that. And I want, you to, I want to encourage you every day this week to recognize that you are part of God's heavenly, not heavenly, God's earthly host. And God wants to use you. And there's an epic battle going on between good and evil. And God wants to use us as his heavenly, no, his earthly force to accomplish his purposes, to bring light and life and love into this world. The darkness doesn't get to have the final word. God triumphs in the end. And that leads me once more to the, to the uh, verse, verse three of let all mortal flesh, flesh keep silence. Rank on rank, the hosts of heaven spreads its vanguard on the way as the light of life descendeth from the realms of endless day. Listen, that the powers of hell may vanish and the darkness clears away. We are that vanguard of the hosts on earth in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Oh God, we offer ourselves to you. We are profoundly grateful that you are God Almighty, the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, that in the end, darkness and hate and evil and even death, all are defeated. Help us to believe and trust in that. Help us, O oh Lord, to resist the wiles of the devil, to recognize his voice when he whispers in our ears and help us instead to hear your voice saying, you are loved and you are mine and there is hope. Use us, we pray. Help us to pay attention that this week we might be a part of your earthly host. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again for live worship online or in person. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.